All right. All right. Well, um, one of the best known British poets of the 20th, I mean, poets, <laughs> um, painters of the 20th century. And um, shame more people don't know about him in the United States. Uh, he lived from 1891 to 1959. Uh, he became well known for his paintings depicting biblical scenes occurring as if in uh, Cookham, which is the small village where he lived. Okay, so it's like the Christ, the the New Testament, the Old Testament taking place right here in the present moment. Um, there's a small village beside the River Thames where he was born and spent much of his life. Um, Spencer referred to Cookham as a village in heaven. And in his biblical scenes, fellow vill villagers are shown as their gospel counterparts. Spencer was skilled at organizing multi-figure compositions, such as in his large paintings for the um, <coughs> Santa Memorial Chapel. Um, moving on, Spencer's works often express his fervent, if unconventional, Christian faith. This is especially evident in the scenes that he based in Cookham, which show the compassion that he felt for, for his fellow residents and, and also his romantic and sexual obs obsession. Uh, his works originally provoked great shock and controversy. Nowadays, they still seem stylistic. An experimental while the new works depicting his feudal relationships with his second wife, uh, Patricia Pierce, such as Leg of Mutton, <laughs> foreshadows some of the much later works, Evolution Freud. Uh, <clears throat> okay, you can, say, you can see an influence of Gauguin, but also influence of an uh, early Italian Renaissance painting typified by Giotto. And <clears throat> in later life, he remained an independent artist, did not join any artistic movement. Uh, of the period, although he did show three works at the second post-impressionist exhibition in 1912. And he just worked and worked and worked. He painted like um, around the clock, apparently, and uh, lived on <laughs> peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, didn't even take time out to cook, uh, make himself healthy meals. <clears throat> All right, so let's do take shots a little bit, and then we'll go to wiki art. Now, one question, Joe. Yeah. You say he he paints of Christ in modern times. Did you say that? Yeah. Well, in this village, like biblical New, New Testament scenes, or I think even also in, in his village. His yeah, but that's that's modern village. times, and right. it's interesting because he's born very near when Baba was born. So Baba was already on Earth. Right. A couple, of, you know what I mean. I think artists sense big, important change, and oh. I think he was sensing it. <laughs> yeah, you knew something was up. Hello, Liverpool. I'm Sean Pattenden and I'm at the Tate Liverpool where there is a Stanley Spencer exhibition and Stanley is one of my favourite painters. Stanley Spencer was an English painter who operated in the 1920s to 1959 when he died. He was a visionary, someone who just stuck to his own path. He was not influenced by his contemporaries. He painted what he wanted to and he was prolific. He painted all day and all night, if he could. He survived on jam sandwiches in his studio and had barely time for anything else. Um, as a result, we get these epic pictures where there are lots of people in, influenced by the Renaissance, um, a lot of it Giotto. He was a big fan of Masaccio. And you can really sense a spirit and a vision and a love in Stanley Spencer, which I don't think that you find in a lot of other painters. Some people would call it a naivety, and some people would say there's a lack of cynicism there, which we modern people like. But I think if you go and look there and find it, you will see so much of human life and death that there is a depth to it that many other painters do lack. 
This is The Resurrection, Cookham by Stanley Spencer, which was finished in 1927. What you've got basically is a churchyard and loads of graves. Something that someone else might have done something very gothic with, with and scary becomes this joyous place and you have people coming out of the earth, quite literally, being reborn again. One of my favourite bits is that Stanley Spencer will always put himself in the picture. He's over there, I believe, in the sort of tweedy suit with the trousers, and he's looking at what probably is, his, is Hilda, his first wife. It's a fantastic image, and it's very beautiful, that, also that Spencer's not, not even facing us. He doesn't want to see us. In the background, you have the couples, and very much what Spencer was interested in is the minutiae, and this kind of love of a wife dusting the uh, coat so it didn't have any horrible cat hairs on it or something before they went out and making sure that the husband was presentable. And then we have the gravestones and people looking at their own gravestones and the inscriptions. And, and not with any sort of faint horror that you might find nowadays, but this absolute sort of rapture that here they are back again. And this is also a sort of resurrection of Stanley's hopes and dreams. He was married, as I say. He'd also survived f the First World War, which was quite a feat. Um, and there's something about the, the joy and discovery and constant discovery that he wants to put in this painting. It's also done in a wonderful V shape, if you see, that's very pleasing to the eye, which is sort of, keep, sort of holds you in and keeps you there. Um, there's also Stanley, very obviously, at the corner here, he said of this tomb, the way that it's broken is like a book and that it's his favourite place to be because he loved reading so much, as much as he loved writing, as much as he loved painting. Mm. There's also the women talking to each other. Um, they have love letters that they were going to give to their partners and that's coming up. And love letters are something that Stanley wrote all his life. Although it's got lots and lots of figures in it and lots of stories and lots of narratives, it's not saying this is the thing about joy, so we're going to have everyone in yellow and they're going to be going, hooray! It's, it's something that's also contemplative. I mean, even Stanley is uh, not looking at the action, he's contemplating. It's about everyone working together. I also think that naked person there is Stanley, and I think that's about the First World War and sort of being stripped of everything and coming back. It could be a soldier coming back and, uh, mm. and having a look around. Um, but I think as a whole, I think... You just don't find painting like this now. You, you don't walk into a gallery and see these epics. You know, you, you get the idea that, that he was guided. He wasn't very happy with this top left corner there, apparently, and went to go and see a constable exhibition and then came back inspired. But I rather like it, because you don't know whether those people are leaving or coming in to watch. I think they're coming in to watch. Um. Whether those people are leaving. Style is um, top. What he's painting it is really unusual for the 20th century. I mean, he's he was out on his own limb. He's following his own songline artistically. Uh, he, just the fact of an epic paintings, um, many many figures, lots going on. You know, hark back to the Renaissance, the Baroque period. The, the, the tonal quality of the paints is, is um, early Renaissance, muted colors, almost like a temper. It's not very modern and, and very subdued. It all works. It all has a, you know, um, a consistent tone throughout, but it's, it's like um, <clears throat> there isn't the, um, the, the modern type of shading and use of uh, um, <clears throat> colors that are typical of the 20th century. And so it's, it's uh, um, yeah, he's just very different in that sense. You couldn't classify him anyway. Uh, so, all right, so let's give you a little taste of him. We'll look at WikiArt. Uh, uh, this has a number of his works. Their intro, he was one of the leading figures in British art between the world wars. <clears throat> he had his first one man show in 1927. So that, that painting, he received rave reviews for the painting we just looked at the resurrection of him. And the Times described as the most important picture painted by an English artist in the present century. So 
immediately got a claim for that. The plain shows everyday people emerging from their graves, watched by God, Christ, and the prophets. Uh, and <laughs> Joe, uh, I think he probably saw a battle because he's young enough to get the draft or whatever they do in the UK. But he spent, that was a horrible, World War I was horrible. So he survived it. Uh, for Spencer, again, Cochran was a village in heaven. And in his paintings, he tried to express the mystical qualities he found in ordinary activities. Quite, some, quite suddenly, I became aware that everything was full of special meaning. And this made every day whole. I observed the sacred, I think this is scared quality, that's a typo, it should be the sacred quality in the most unexpected quarters. Following his success, Spencer began working on a series of murals for the Santa Memorial, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I think we'll look at that. Inspired by Giotto's Arena Chapel in Padua, Spencer arranged the paintings in the chapel to resemble older pieces in uh, a Renaissance church made. Uh, then he had some setbacks, um, um, and then relationship problems, uh, to a couple marriages. But then in the 40s, looks like his career stabilized. And after World War II, we worked on two large uh, painting series. Uh, okay. All right. So let's just take a look at selection of his paintings here. Let me see if I can do this and get rid of the. You got to download it and then yeah, they don't bother you anymore. Okay. So hopefully it'll work. Soldiers Watch. All right. <clears throat> Yeah, so somebody's got his head in the sink, someone's polishing the faucet, looks like, and someone's washing their hands. But uh, like I said, it looks, uh, does not look like modern, modern painting. Uh, throwing tears, 1927. Kind of like a wounded shoulder soldiers. Wow, there's 273 paintings, so we won't be able to look at them all. So I have to skip around. So, <clears throat> the resurrection of the soldiers. Not that it's his wife, maybe at least I think it was. <clears throat> the tar is so cool. So, and just uh, this town, this in a totally insignificant object, you drive by it all the time, but he gave it some uh, importance here. Something about permanence, solidity. And you see these these tones are in the flesh tones of those put in those portraits, these reds and yellows. <clears throat> Tea in the hospital ward. Washing lockers. Well, you know, he often gives you really unusual perspectives too. Oh, that one. Scrubbing the floor. <laughs> so just people at work. Map reading. What was this? Which dead soldiers collage? One soldier reading maps. Okay. War images. World War One images, I guess. Let's skip ahead. So. Head making. Everyday activities. 
Does this remind you of Grant Wood in any way? Uh, I don't know Grant Wood. Okay. Does it remind you of Grant Wood? Yeah, kind of. He's, uh, tell me a little bit about Grant Wood. Wasn't, isn't he the guy that uh, did the painting with the, the man and the woman with the pitchforks? Oh, I see. Is that Grant? Yeah, I think so. I don't know enough of his work to say. But yeah, maybe I could see that there's sort of a, um, a very simplistic, primitive style almost, both just that uh, the pitchfork painting, which is frostbite, hospital scenes. Making a fire bell. So these are all, if you look at the just um, compositions, they're all complex uh, arrangement of figures. Um, <clears throat> yeah, this, I mean, I had to give it a great deal of thought how I wanted to arrange the figures, get the, uh, and he's not, he's not worried too much about everyone being this consistent size, you know, the size of this person. There's a small person here. So there's a, this is a distortion. It's not using realistic perspective. A, a question, what is a fire belt? What is that? Making a fire, I guess a uh, fire belt, I think is when there's a forest fire. They, they Oh, right. Uh, yeah. yeah, they keep uh, it going. Well, I heard these uh, are intense. Wow. Another word is fire break. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, and also just the, a very simple color wise uh, tones of uh, ochre and white, pretty much. Earth tones, which he uses that's in his palette throughout. Kid inspection. There's a cart, there's a bit of a cartoon quality to his, his work, I think. Patient suffering from frostbite. I think I saw that. Tea in the hospital war. People are in their own world. They're not really interacting with each other. This, this person's, a couple of people are sleeping, but uh, people are thinking like this person and looking away. Could be shell shock, people from the war. Blacksmith's yard. Meeting. I don't know if she's looking at you, but not looking at you, that's what I see at the same time. <clears throat> He's just gazing outwardly, but also seems to be lost in our own thoughts. Sour tub in the heavenly visit. I don't know who Sour tub is. Making columns for the tower bubble, bubble. So just here the biblical themes with in his town is starting to come out. Who are we here in terms of the year? Can we see that one again, the fighting swans? That was quick. <clears throat> oh, wow. Wow. They may be cartoon-like, but they're not funny. <laughs> well, all cartoons are not funny. I mean, there's a yeah, spot. but it, normally they're more on the lighter side. Than this, these are intense. Wow. 
I think his pictures draw you in to ask what's happening, you know? Uh, for sure. And thanks. I like his work. It's really great. So his landscapes, he's using a brighter palette, broader, uh, more color. This one more gives into the color. Yeah. Brightening the color. <laughs> it's a very simple act, right? Every day, hardly worth painting, most people think. But Workmen in the house. Well, this palette's getting uh, more complex here with reds, greens. These are complex compositions. You know, it takes a great deal of skill to get the drawings right, to make it work. If you look at you know where the where he takes the eye. Um, <clears throat> And you know, you see a little Lucian Freud. We we did look at Lucian Freud with the, you know, all the blemishes of the human body exaggerated, unromanticized, you know, no airbrushing, <laughs> latches and birthmarks and age marks. Six bridesmaids of Cana. So, in a biblical story, he brings into his hometown. Where they're all entangled with each other. They're like complex drawing. <clears throat> Let me zoom ahead to some. Uh, so we get sampling of his later work. <clears throat> Let me go back one. <clears throat> this is a well known one of his uh, portraits of his get out of your wife and him. Yes, he's not. <clears throat> Skin color is metallic, right? <clears throat> pretty intense, pretty serious. Double new portrait, the artist, and the second one. The leg of mutton. <laughs> this is one of those ones for daring. <clears throat> and again, Lucian Freud uh, qualities to the bodies. All the unity and dogs. You know, some dolls move up, become a girl, become the older woman. So it's, maybe it's her life, almost like her life story. Oh, it's very nice. Beatitudes of love, eight worship. Oh, puppies. So you can look quite a, quite a few landscapes. I'm just gonna add some more. The landscapes are beautiful, but they're almost a needed, necessary rest from his intensity for me. <laughs> Christ in the wilderness, the eagles. <laughs> wow. Hmm.
resurrection, the reunion of families. His landscapes are pretty realistic, completely yeah. different from the yeah. style of something like this. Exactly. Yeah, he, it's like he went back and forth between you know realism versus these uh, visionary kind of paintings with the more muted palette, grays and greens, gray greens around. I like the way he unifies his composition but in terms of color. He's using complementary colors, red and greens, but in very subdued uh, form. And there's a you know, <clears throat> group of people here on the left, group of people here, children down the middle, space down the middle. <clears throat> Joe, is there any um, timing? Did he do, do one or the other, or it's all mixed up in what he was painting them? I have no idea. You know, did he do his? Okay. No, no idea what what his sequence was for doing that. Yeah. Well, there's oh, this is complex. Yeah. So there's a there's a and when he does these. Um, Visionary or people of work, they're, con they're really complex compositions. Um, there's no one perspective. It takes a great deal of skill to do it, to make it work, to plan it. <clears throat> Joe, do you have any, sen any sense of what he's exploring with these paintings? Um, what do you think? I mean, with, we got some I of the from well, the yeah. introduction, but what do you get? Tell you tell me. I don't know, like the one that we just saw with, the, you know, he was down at the bottom and it looked like he was painting. Back one more. Oops. This one. No, the, the one where, yeah, so I think he's down at the bottom painting. Is that him? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Right. And, then, and then we just see different aspects of, because everybody's in the same color. And I don't know, it's like, Different points of view. Every uh, everybody has their head down. He's painting and they're welding and um, are doing. Uh, at least the people here, they're all got their face in the work, and maybe welding. You know, you got to protect yourself from the fire. Maybe and that's a good point to go a little deeper. You have to protect yourself from the fire and maybe art as a fire as a vision. He's got his face here mm -hmm. in the fire, yeah. uh, being protected like there's a. Somehow the creative process is, a, is connected to your own inner fire. Um, that's what's come to mind. It's linking the two. Uh, the process of welding, bringing um, uh, <clears throat> through fire, bringing disparate elements together and merging them, making them one, different pieces of metal or iron. Uh, pieces of himself maybe trying to come together. Yeah, could be that, yeah. There's a, almost like an alchemy, a mm -hmm. chemical process. Yeah, that's a good point. Glad we went back to this. But you know, the artists at work, this is very unusual. All, many artists did Rembrandt did it. Here he is with um, that. I assume this is his palette where he has his oils and his faces in it, you know, <laughs> 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 just like the welders. So a really unique uh, pers perspective in here, looking at him from the back. Uh, Vermeer, <laughs> Vermeer painter work. Uh, but, but look, look at what he's welding in, in the upper right, left-hand corner. It's just like boxes. Yeah, right. Oh, and the bottom right is like a frame, perhaps. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> could be anything. It's a welding a ship or whatever, a house and something. Yeah. Yeah, um, and these people over here in the upper right, uh, I'm maybe maybe the other ca they're carrying. Is this there a title for this picture? Yeah, it's called Welders. Welders. Huh. <laughs> uh, they're carrying the sheets of metal. Maybe they've already been welded, and it just keeps going into the this this, this figure here, this figure here, this figure here. This they keep going. So it's like they're coming in. To the, there's an entrance way here, upper right, and they're coming in, they're coming in, and then maybe they're, they're these are their workstations. All these new parts that he has to put together. Yeah, yeah. 
so I, so you're right it's psychological also good point yeah yeah in our inner work of it seems like all of those scenes where there are a lot of people that's that's it's very psychological or yeah or social some comment This is the temple. So this is some obscure thing they're building. Doesn't really say. They have a template. It's what it could be anything. It doesn't look like it's anything. It could be a spaceship or something. It looks like a boat, a big ship. Yeah. Okay. But it's uh, yeah, it's an abstract painting too. There's a theme of work. Yep. That's work. Right. Yeah. And, and you know, work is uh, kind of like the, maybe the apostles too in some of these activities. Um, elevating everyday work to um, kind of like Van Gogh did in a way, the, the common man in his daily job, plumbers. These are not, these are people getting their hands dirty. Plumbers, look at all these, look at all these shapes, you know. Burners. Rivers. So, so much of it is these groups of people, like they're, um, the individual doesn't stand out. It's a collective, collective effort, I think was one thing he's emphasizing, you know, the social nature of work. It's not, it's not, even though he was so different from what he did, you know, isolated painter. And then he's painting all these scenes of groups of people working. Maybe, maybe he longed for that, you know. He's working day and night by himself. <clears throat> Let's move on a little more. Let's see. Is that the resurrection? Here, here, is why she awakening, yawning. Women's work, taking care of children. Yeah. Waking up, resurrection, waking up, it's called. Reunion of families. The resurrection, tidying. I don't think we've ever seen a artist that has so much going on. I know. In paintings. Exactly. I mean, you could look at the painting for a long time to try to figure out everything that's happening. This is the one the psychiatrist. <laughs> Wouldn't think of it, this person as a psychiatrist, but unless you without knowing the title. The furnace man. Yeah, you know, the most lowly job shoving coal into people's basements. <clears throat> and he gave him special status. 
So he did have a great respect, I would say, in his paintings for the common working man in his village. And just jump ahead to the two hundreds. Whoops, that one got up there. Portrait of Hilda Carlyle. All his portraits, people are very introspective. Um, sometimes they're sad or certainly looking within, maybe like <clears throat> remembering, reflecting on their life. Angels of the Apocalypse. Well, <laughs> these are my, you know, look at it, it's just everyday people from this town. He's turned into angels. But his portraits are very relatable. They look so like people. Yeah. Well. Love letters. Huh. Person's what has a letter right in a person's face? Wonder why. Looks like he's eating them or licking them or something. Then a chair, this huge chair. Maybe that's the love letters that he's writing. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, he's just putting them to his face because he can smell the person. Maybe. He's kissing maybe, the maybe there's perfume on the letter. Right, right. Yeah. Well, he's kissing the letter, not the woman. So maybe yeah. he's in love with the love. Yeah, yeah, there's a kiss. Maybe he's smelling perfume on the letter. So it's very intimate connection with this piece of paper. It's the yeah. person at the letter, the piece, the letter becomes the person. <clears throat> the sausage shop. <laughs> That's great. Oh, gee. <laughs> and this diangular sweep here. The, the arms are like sausages from the butcher. Let's move on to some butcher of Daphne Spencer. That was hard. There is a, even in these portraits, there's a Renaissance quality to the, to the face, I think. Christ preaching at Cookum Regatta, punts me. <laughs> like Jesus on the Sea of Galilee, here it's the Christ preaching at Cook and Regatta, girls listening. So it's, um, we've got more video on him, but it's so completely individualistic, this artist. I mean, there's, you can see where he didn't, couldn't fit him into any school. He's out there on his own. His, you know, his landscapes are beautiful. He's, he can do detail, he can do realism extremely well if he wants. At the piano. 
in these unusual perspectives, you know, where where's he standing when he paints this? Like up at the ceiling, looking down. <clears throat> Can you imagine what's going through this guy's mind to create all this? <sighs> now in the world, I wonder if that's why he died so young. <laughs> I wonder if he was very lonely, you know, and he put people in his photo in his. Yeah, what well, I was thinking too. Yeah, I mean, I mean, he had two wives. He had some, he had relationships, but they didn't go well. So I think there's some sadness about his fate of his marriages. All right, let's uh, we'll do that one. The crucifixion. <clears throat> hmm. Then, I mean, your perspective right up here at the cross beam. You're right up there with them, with Jesus. As usual, it's from looking up at them. <clears throat> All right. Uh, two shots. Well, let's do this life, his life, to learn, you know, learn more about, answer some of those questions. This is 18 minutes. Real fruit. Paul Greens. Hello, my name is Paul Priestley. Welcome to Art History School, the home of art history for everyone. Today we are going to look at the English artist Stanley Spencer, whose work is a rich mix of spirituality, religion and eccentricity, played out against the backdrop of one small village in England. Stanley Spencer was born on the 30th of June 1891 in a semi-detached house in the high street of Cookham on Thames, Berkshire, England. His grandfather had built the property and several others in Cookham and his cousins lived next door. The family had lived in the village for generations and Spencer lived there for most of his life. Cookham was his world, his being, the source of his inspiration for much of his work that he produced. Stanley Spencer was a small man, around five foot two inches tall, with a wiry build, but he was not to be trifled with. He had bags of energy, an ebullient personality, and was very appreciative. He stood out in a crowd and was very engaging, but he could be exhausting. He was the 10th child of a family of 11. Two of his siblings died in infancy. His mother, Anna, looked after the children whilst his father, William, an organist, taught music to the many pupils who came to the house. They were a cultured, but not a wealthy family. Spencer's education was rudimentary. He was home educated by his sisters, Florence and Anna because his parents had reservations about the local school and could not afford to send him to private school. Nevertheless, growing up in a family consumed by literature, music and religion provided a rich environment for his imagination to flourish. This, together with his Methodist upbringing and his spirituality, would have a major impact on his paintings. He was a solitary teenager often taking long walks, filling innumerable sketchbooks with drawings. A local artist did give him drawing and painting lessons, but his father wanted to develop his skills further. So he approached the local landowner, Lady Boston of Hensor, for advice. In 1907, she arranged for Spencer to go to the Maidenhead Technical Institute. Interestingly, his father agreed, provided Spencer took no examinations. In 1908, he was accepted at the prestigious Slade School of Fine Art in London and studied there for four years. Amongst his contemporaries was Paul Nash, Mark Gertler and David Bomberg. He was nicknamed Cookham 
because he never stopped talking about the village and for his habit of travelling home from London every day to classes. It was not long before his work was being appreciated. He won several prizes at the Slade and in 1912 exhibited his painting John Donne Arriving in Heaven, plus several drawings in Roger Fry. Um, I just did an interview on um, Thursday with a poet and follow Bobble or Rosie Jackson. And Rosie uh, has the one of the poems she read was based was this John Donne that she she read John Donne arriving in heaven. But she also we didn't have time, but she, she also has um, won a prize for her one of the poems she did on um, on uh, one of Spencer's paintings. His second post impressionist exhibition in London. Later in 1912, he returned to Cookham to paint at his parents' house and began working on the Apple Gatherers, which was shown at the Contemporary Art Society the following year. At the start of the First World War in 1914, he wanted to enlist, but his mother persuaded him to apply for ambulance duties. So in 1915, he joined the Royal Medical Corps and worked at the Beaufort War Hospital in Bristol, an asylum commandeered by the army to treat wounded soldiers. He found the experience tough, but his outlook was transformed by a chance meeting with Desmond Chute, who gave him a copy of St. Augustine's Confessions. It taught Spencer to find God and take solace in everyday tasks and routines. This philosophy would go on to inform much of Spencer's work. In August 1916, he was posted to Salonika, then in Macedonia, as part of the 68th Field Ambulancemen. It was here he witnessed the horrific impact of bombardment and machine gun fire. The 1917 Spencer volunteered for the 7th Battalion, the Royal Berkshire Infantry Regiment. He spent almost two years at the front line before being invalided out with persistent bouts of malaria, shortly after his brother Sidney was killed in 1918. The war had an incalculable impact on his life. He wrote to his sister Florence, when I come home, I'm going to learn fresco painting. We are going to build a church. Oh, um, I actually just broke up with my boyfriend this morning. Oh, dude. After the war, he returned to Cookham, where he continued to work on Swan Upping, which he'd started in early 1915. But he, but he found it incredibly difficult to finish. In 1919, Spencer was asked by the British War Memorials Committee to paint a large painting for a planned Hall of Remembrance which was never built. Spencer's response was his famous war painting, Travois arriving with wounded at a dressing station at Small. The painting was begun in 1919 and marks the beginning of a theme that would... Oh. Yeah, a really unusual perspective. It's like uh, looking down, but also this multiple perspective one. would endure throughout his career that of finding the spiritual in the everyday the composition is dynamic in the way the medics and the wounded move upwards towards the light of the operating theater the theater glows with the light of potential survival against the horror of the dark night a clear spiritual reference. This is emphasised in the lower right hand corner where a man walks away looking back at the hospital. His arm is bright white, a positive light against the darkness beyond. In 1923 Spencer stayed for a short period with the artist Henry Lamb in Dorset where he worked on ideas for his church and war paintings. During this time, Lamb invited Louis and Mary Berend to his house, where they saw Spencer's acres of Salonica and Bristol War Hospital sketches. They were so impressed, they agreed to commission Spencer to build his castle in the sky. On hearing the news, Spencer is said to have exclaimed, What-o, Giotto? In recognition of Giotto's 
Arena Chapel in Padua, Italy, that had inspired his ideas. Although the chapel was supposed to be a memorial to Mary's brother, Lieutenant Henry Sandham, it was very much Spencer's project. The chapel was built in the village of Berkeley in Hampshire. Spencer had wanted it to be in Cookham. In 1925, he married Hilda Carline, who he had met at the Slade in 1919. They had got engaged in 1922, but Spencer had repeatedly postponed the wedding. Their first child, Sherin, was born later that year. In 1927, his painting, The Resurrection Cookham, was exhibited at... I'm sorry, this is one of his most famous paintings that we really looked at. That's an amazing painting, it really is. So much going on. Goupil Gallery in London to great critical acclaim and later presented to the Tate Gallery. The Spencers then moved to Berkeley so he could concentrate on his paintings for the Sandham Memorial Chapel. The Barons were exceptionally generous patrons, not only paying for the chapel to be built to Spencer's specifications but they also built a house for him and his family to live in while he worked at Berkeley. Spencer worked on the chapel for five years oh. as a way of processing the mental scars left by the horrors of war. The paintings show conflict and injury, as well as the more everyday aspects of warfare, soldiers eating, sleeping and having their injuries tended to. The smaller panels show scenes from the Beaufort War Hospital. The centrepiece of the chapel is the resurrection of the soldiers, mm -hmm. in which men and animals lay stricken on the ground amidst the destruction. But if you look closely, the soldiers are in the process of being reborn, a resurrection. The soldiers meet, shake hands and untangle themselves from barbed wire and bandages. Here, Spencer is offering love as redemption. He is showing that anything is possible in art and that time can be rewound. This was the perfect imaginary world that Spencer longed for. In 1930, his second daughter, Unity, was born and the family moved to Cookham in 1932 into a substantial house called Lindwick. Spencer was elected an associate member of the Royal Academy of Arts in London in 1932 and also exhibited at the Venice Biennale. Later that year, he met Patricia Priest, an aspiring artist who lived in the village with her close friend, another more talented artist, Dorothy Hepworth. Priest seemed very exotic and totally captivated Spencer, modelling for several of his paintings. In return, he took her on shopping trips, buying her furs and jewellery. In 1935, Spencer resigned from the Royal Academy after the Hanging Committee rejected his paintings, St Francis and the Birds and The Dustman or the Lovers. As owner of Mint Mobile, I always want to find ways to save you money. So let's meet the barely paid spokesperson. His relationship with Patricia Priest was becoming more intense and eventually led to divorce. Just four days after his divorce from Hilda in 1937, he married Patricia Priest. She was gay and although they were lovers, they never lived together after the marriage. In fact, Patricia and Dorothy, who Spencer didn't realise were lifelong lovers, left together for the honeymoon in St Ives, leaving Spencer in Cookham. Within days, he had seduced his former wife, Hilda, and seemed genuinely surprised at her anger when he told her he was going to join Patricia in St Ives. Priest reacted furiously when she found out, and consequently, the marriage was never consummated. It appears he failed to explain his domestic ambitions to either woman, and consequently lost both. Shortly after the marriage, Spencer signed over the deeds of the cook. It appears he failed uh, to explain. Commemorates the thousands of letters of passed between Stanley and Hillary during their life. Huh. His domestic ambitions to either woman, huh. and consequently lost both. 
Shortly after the marriage, Spencer signed over the deeds of the Cookham house to Patricia Priest. She then forced him to leave, rented out the property and lived on the proceeds. Within two years, Spencer was penniless and living in a bedsit in Swiss Cottage in London. He was convinced he was destined to be with Patricia Priest. Perhaps the bitter irony of Spencer's foolishness is revealed in this painting. Although the image suggests something between you and me which must not be broken and the law does not allow me to have two wives and I must and will have two. My development as an artist depends on my having both you and Patricia from an uncertain letter by Stanley T. Hilda, his first wife. Okay. <clears throat> physical intimacy, there doesn't seem to be an emotional connection. Her expression suggests boredom and disappointment as she gazes gloomily towards the bottom of the canvas. He stares directly at her, but doesn't seem much happier than she is. Spencer has depicted every crease, every fold of flesh and the myriad of skin tones brilliantly, creating a painting that is unnervingly candid. Despite everything, Spencer was very conscious of his family responsibilities, but he completely lacked any ability to manage his own finances. He needed to earn money, so his agent, Dudley Tooth, persuaded him to paint anything that would sell, which was essentially landscapes and portraits. In 1940, not long after the start of the Second World War, he was commissioned by the War Artists Advisory Committee to paint scenes at the Lithgow shipyard in Glasgow. Spencer was fascinated by what he saw and proposed a scheme involving 64 canvases. The committee agreed to a series of 11, some of which would be up to six metres long. The first two paintings, Burners and Colkers, were completed by the end of August 1940. The committee purchased the three parts of Burners for £300, but not Corkers, instead requesting a further painting, Welders, which he completed in March 1940. Later, in 1943, he completed Bending the Keel Plate. This enormous work brings shipbuilding to life. Despite being a very unpleasant and noisy environment, Spencer created harmony through the repeated shapes, smooth surfaces and carefully choreographed figures. In his own unique way, Spencer conferred an almost religious fervour onto the men as they worked. But these paintings also demonstrate Spencer's compositional skills uh -huh. and his love of combining opposites, dirt and glory, the earthly and the profound, the everyday and the spiritual. The War Artists Advisory Committee obviously held Spencer in high regard as they paid all his expenses and materials and even accepted his refusal to fill in any forms or sign a contract. <coughs> In 1945, Spencer moved to Clevedon View in Cookham and began work on his resurrection paintings. Spencer's original plan was to paint a canvas some 50 feet wide, but soon realised that this was impractical. So he decided to create a series of paintings instead, the largest of which were six metres wide. Resurrection, the Hill of Sion, Resurrection Port Glasgow were supplemented by a series of triptyches, Reunion, Rejoicing, Waking Up and The Raising of Jarius's Daughter, plus a couple of smaller pieces. More were planned but were never finished. Spencer wanted the entire series displayed together but each piece was sold to different collectors. In 1947, the Sandham Memorial Chapel was given to the National Trust by the Behrens family. And three years later, in 1950, the outgoing president of the Royal Academy, Sir Alfred Munnings, initiated a police prosecution against Spencer ah. for obscenity. Nothing came of it, but the press reported that an unnamed owner of the pictures had agreed to destroy them. He rejoined the Royal Academy later in 1950 after Munnings left and was elected a Royal Academician 
as well as being awarded the CBE. Later that year, Hilda, his first wife, died. Yet he continued to write to her until his own death. Later, in 1955, a major retrospective exhibition of his work was held at the Tate Gallery in London to much acclaim. During the 1950s, Spencer could be seen wandering the lanes of Cookham, pushing an old pram in which he carried his canvas and easel. If it was cold, he would wear his pyjamas under his suit. <laughs> his pram is now a major exhibit in the Stanley Spencer Gallery in Cookham. Spencer was knighted by the Queen in 1958, but in December of that year he was diagnosed with cancer. He underwent an operation at the Canadian uh, Red Cross Memorial Hospital on the Clevedon Estate in early 1959, and after the operation stayed with friends in Dewsbury, in Yorkshire. There, between the 12th and the 16th of July, he painted his final self-portrait, still determined and defiant. Later, in 1959, Spencer moved back into his childhood home, Thurnley. But on the 14th of December 1959, he died at the Canadian War Memorial Hospital. At the time of his death, his painting, Christ Preaching at Cookham Regatta, remained unfinished. Spencer was cr cremated and his ashes interned in Cookham Churchyard, together with those of Hilda, his first wife. Stanley Spencer was a very sociable character, who's often labelled as eccentric. In fact, Patricia Priest in her diaries even called him mad. As a character, he was certainly different and unusual. Yet it, this small man with twinkling eyes and shaggy grey hair was undoubtedly one of Britain's greatest artists. Thank you for watching. I hope you've really enjoyed learning about Stanley Spencer a truly unique artist. If you have, then please... All right. <clears throat> now one more short one. By works by Stanley Spencer. My name is Jane Monroe. I'm keeper of paintings, drawings and prints at the Fitzwilliam Museum. We're standing here in Gallery 1 of the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge. It's a gallery in which we hang pictures of the early 20th century, both of British and European schools. In 2013, the museum had the great good fortune to acquire five works by Stanley Spencer, which significantly enhanced our existing collection of Spencer's work. All five works belong to Gwen Raverat, who was not only Charles Darwin's great-granddaughter, but a student friend of Spencer and remained his lifelong friend. The five works in question were allocated to the museum through the acceptance and use scheme, which gave the Fitzwilliam um, the opportunity to acquire them. We were able to do so with the generous funding of the Art Fund, the Wilson Foundation, but also, but also with the V&A Purchase Grant and our great supporters, the Friends of the Fitzwilliam Museum. This work is one of the earliest of the group that we acquired in 2013. It's called John Donne Arriving in Heaven and it's actually one of the very earliest paintings that Spencer painted. He was still at the Slade School of Art when he painted it. This is one of a small group of paintings at the beginning of Spencer's career that feature something religious and also something about love, in this case the love of God and these of course were themes that absolutely dominated Spencer's work throughout his career. This painting was chosen to be exhibited in the second Post-Impressionist exhibition 
in the Grafton Galleries in Bond Street in London in 1912. So a huge accolade for a 20-year-old artist. And there it hung in the last gallery alongside works by Picasso, Vlaminck, Matisse and Roger Fry. So artists by whom Spencer in this gallery now is surrounded. These two oil sketches were made by Spencer after he returned from the front. In 1916, he goes to Macedonia and serves in the 68th Field Ambulance Unit. These are very day-to-day, -day, in some ways, scenes of military life with his fellow soldiers in Macedonia. We see the making of a Red Cross as a recognition element for aircraft and they're scrubbing their clothes in the bed of the river Sturma. This oil sketch and the finished painting of the makers of the columns, the Tower of Babel, are what's left of his ideas for the commission to decorate the newly built University Library in Cambridge. You have a group of builders who were probably inspired by builders carrying hods of bricks whom he saw in his native Cookham. Spencer is very much one of the most significant British artists of the 20th century, who gives us an entire mythology and world view. The acquisition of these five works can rightly be described as transformative. They cover the very part of Spencer's career which we didn't represent very well, particularly the early works. They also bring a new element of the autobiographical into the museum's collections, so it brilliantly complements our existing holdings. I read um, <coughs> that poem by <coughs> Rosie. Let's see, John Donne arriving in heaven. She won a prize for this, Spencer Prize. He knew it would be a melting, looking back at the world as a place of icicles and clouds, lilies of passion unmooring their tangled roots. Again, this poem is uh, inspired by the painting by Spencer. Knew that with the rungs of prayer and reason knocked away, the subtle knot undone, he would step into this delicate permanence the light cleansing as protracted evening sun perfects a field of harvest corn. <clears throat> Expected such radiance that finds no flaws in all that's happened, no severity, only the mercy of a paradise always autumn, its joy possessed, ripe, perfect, complete. But this is less the arrival he foresaw than an undoing of distances, a shedding of himself to become who he already was. <clears throat> Not gaining union, but losing the illusion he was separate was ever other than this one, the hand that set all things in motion. Spread this equal light made on a whim, the stars, the schoolboys, the unruly sun. All love a dream of this. And now as he takes on the bliss, the infinite bliss, his little deaths on earth struggle to reach, he finds his words at last translated to their proper tongue. <clears throat> All right, any uh, any uh, comments, final comments about Stanley, his work, the person? <clears throat> I think it's amazing. He's not. Um, was a, he was absolutely amazing artist. He is was. I've never seen one with so much uh, uh, variety. variety to his work yeah. and so complicated. Yeah. And I but feel stupid. Uh, I never heard of him. Brilliant draftsman, very imaginative. Um, integrating um, history of European art, going back to Giotto. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, why haven't we heard of them in the United States? And uh, I don't know. Anyway, why haven't we heard of Tarsla do Amaral? How many of you have heard of her? Well, if you were from Brazil, everybody would know that name. Everybody knows the name Tarsla. Okay, she's the, 
the person who brought modern art into Brazil. So we're gonna look at her, her work and study her a bit. Going across the Atlantic and went to Brazil. Persola do Amara, which she is. Uh, <clears throat> She lived 1886, died in 73, was a Brazilian painter, dress woman, and translator. She is considered one of the leading Latin American modernist artists and is regarded as the painter who best achieved Brazilian aspirations for nationalistic expression in a modern style. As a member of the Grupo dos Cinco, Tarsila is also considered a major influence in modern, the modern art movement in Brazil. Uh, with uh, Anita Malfatti and a few others there. Um, she was instrumental in the formation of the aesthetic movement, Anthropophagia. In fact, Tarso was one of, was one with her celebrated painting, Amaputu, who inspired blah, 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 other paintings. But anyway, she's a key figure. The, uh, she studied and um, well, learned out her life, but she uh, went to Europe and was there in the 20s, 30s, one of those exciting time to be in Paris and, and absorbed it all. And then um, merged what she learned in Europe at the with contemporary art, Picasso was doing others, and then, and then integrated it with Brazilian folk art, Brazilian myths, Brazilian color, uh, just the whole Brazilian flair. Uh, let's see. Oh, I'll start with this one before going to with the art. In her native country, Brazil, she's as famous as a rock star, known only by her first name, Tarsila. She is probably, arguably, the, the most important and the better known artist uh, of the 20th century in Brazil. She is almost a patrimonial figure. But in the United States, artist Tarsila do Amaral is far from a household name. Did you heard of the artist before? No. I hadn't, no. No, no, we just like, yeah, stumbled into it. I think she's marginally well known. But Luis Perez Aramas is hoping that will soon be a thing of the past. An expert on Latin American art, he's also a curator at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, which is currently hosting the first exhibition in the US exclusively devoted to the artist. Why has it taken so long for an exhibition of this kind to be shown here in the US? There is a canonic, uh, uh, hegemonic uh, way of approaching art history, especially in the second half of the 20th century, that had unfortunately overlooked the complex landscape of multiple modernism before the 1940s. And I think uh, the Museum of Modern Art is, is being truthful to its mission by revisiting those foundational moments of modernism. The fact is that Tarsila was one of these very important artists who at the beginning of the 20th century uh, in their countries, in this case in Brazil, reinvented the idea and the possibility for modern art to exist. The exhibition features nearly 120 works, including paintings, drawings and photographs, tracing key moments in her career. Born in 1886 in a small town on the outskirts of Sao Paulo, Tarsila was raised among the plantation-owning bourgeoisie. Her family's wealth allowed her to travel and pursue higher education, which was unconventional for women at the time. In the 1920s, she left Brazil to study art in Paris, a city she would constantly return to and that would have long-lasting influence on her work. Tarsila returned to Paris many times and trained with many French Cubist masters. She called it her military service in Cubism. What does she mean by that? The fact that uh, if, you, if you go through 
a training process in Paris in the 1920s, you would need to face the legacy of Cubism. And, and she is clever enough not to become a Cubist painter, but just to blend what she can learn from Cubism into her own signature style. Tassila's signature style of painting is bold and colourful, employing a rich colour palette to depict the landscapes and people of her home country. Blending the innovations of European avant-garde with a Brazilian vernacular sensibility, she produced a distinctive body of work. In terms of the landscape that she depicted in 1925, 1924, there is this sensuous, uh, carefully composed, uh, truly colourful way to, to address landscape almost in musical terms, if I, if I would uh, be able to say. In 1928, Tarsila created her most celebrated work, a birthday gift to her husband, Oswald de Andrade. Called Abu Poru, the title means man who eats human flesh in the language of the Tupi Guarani Indians, and it inspired a Brazilian artistic movement known as Antropophagia, which was understood as a form of cultural cannibalism. Somehow she, she anticipated this idea that the uh, Brazilian culture will be the result of the whole digestion of the universal culture of the world and the transformation of that digestion into a specific national culture. She anticipated that in her paintings, in her drawings, by blending uh, modernism with her own knowledge of her own country. So that is why she is absolutely central and universally acknowledged in Brazil as a pillar of modern art in, in, in her country. Soon after the birth of this movement, Tarsila's world changed. The stock market crash of 1929 caused Brazil's coffee economy to collapse, and the nationalist military-led revolution of 1930 begot a series of authoritarian governments. Personally confronted with bankruptcy and at the end of her marriage, Tarsila increasingly turned her attention to political activism, which was reflected in her work. The exhibition ends with this dramatic shift, which signaled Tarsila's embrace of artistic modernism went hand in hand with her recognition of the social ills caused by modernization. Tarsila once famously said, I want to be the painter of my country. With this exhibition introducing a wider international audience to her work and her depictions of Brazil, that dream may finally be realized. Jay Barker, TRT World, New York. So, let's look at um, Wiki Art. Collection of her paintings. On an early one, and do this again. I don't know what that means, a kuka. Um, there's a surrealistic quality in Brazilian art, Brazilian literature that she captures. So I think her style, she's using uh, <clears throat> geometric shapes. 
throughout of various colors to move the eye through the painting. And I see circles and triangles and squares, uh, and people going about their day to day lives. But the simplification of natural forms or the exaggeration of them. <clears throat> Plant forms was part of her work, part of her landscape. We have to do it um, <clears throat> literally, but to simplify the shapes, cactus shapes, for instance, I think. <clears throat> hey, you see Picasso distorting the. This reminds me of see the Picasso's uh, beach scenes or Dolly's uh, distortions. And this also has a, maybe a reference to uh, uh, The Thinker, the famous sculpture, Rodin's The Thinker. I assume these are workers in a factory, uh, making them individuals, not just numbers. Or each face is individual. So you can see the cubism background influence also, geometric shapes. So this is a very complex composition actually. And uh, it works. Using, you know, rectangles, circles, triangles, create an urban scene, train station. Has a childlike simplicity to it. Fair, I think, means festival. Of course, Brazilian, Portuguese, Brazilians speak Portuguese. The bowl. Hmm. 
the fruit vendor Last one. So you get a sense of style, uh, colorful, geometric, some cubic influence going on Brazilian culture. There's more here. Uh, let's see. This one. That's just what I said. Oops, I shared this one. Wrong one. So it's this one. Right Infused with nourishing serum and almond oil, Nivea Essentially Enriched Lotion helps lock in goodness for smooth, luminous skin. Because self-care is all a matter of perspective. For goodness that keeps going, nourish on with Nivea. Now on display, the work of a Brazilian artist who is finally getting the notice she deserves. Faith Saley makes the introduction. In her native country, Brazil, all you need to say is her first name, Tarsila. For Brazilians, her recognition is kind of off the charts. She is the Picasso of Brazil. But in the United States, artist Tarsila do Amaral is virtually unknown. James Rondeau is the director of the Art Institute of Chicago, recent question. home yes, to an exhibit of Tarsila's work. The exhibit is now open at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Why hasn't there been an exhibition devoted to her until now? It's a difficult question to answer in some ways, right? We're facing issues of geography. We're facing issues of gender. So I think this exhibition aims to be a corrective, both in terms of recognition for Tarsila's work, but also in terms of how we understand the story of modernism. Tarsila is considered the mother of modern art in Brazil. Born in 1886 in Sao Paulo on a coffee plantation, her family's wealth allowed her to travel and pursue higher education, which was unconventional for women at the time. In her 30s, she moved to Paris, a single woman determined to become a modern artist. She was in Paris and absorbing, you know, kind of current avant-garde trends, Picasso, Brancusi, Leger, others. She experimented with cubism, and she kind of said, you know, I understand it, it's not for me. She called it her military service. Exactly, it was almost, it was obligatory, right? And she was aware of a responsibility, an ambition, a desire to somehow represent Brazil to be a fundamentally Brazilian artist. It meant painting her homeland's plants and animals with whimsical surrealism and vibrant color. Not just the colors of Brazil's landscape, but of its native people too. 
The colors are absolutely beautiful. Vibrant, tropical. This is not a European palette, right? Yeah. This is a palette that's trying to speak about her native Brazil and a Brazilian sensibility. The leaves are hearts. Do you have a sense of an artist who's actually having fun? Her work inspired a Brazilian art movement called anthropophagia, or cannibalism. <laughs> The term encouraged artists to digest other cultures in order to create new, unique art for Brazil. And they thought, okay, Brazil should be open to everything outside of Brazil. We should assimilate that and transform that into a very specific and unique national culture. Luis Perez Oramas is a leading yes, Latin American art historian well, exactly and curator of the exhibit at MoMA. Want, she accomplished her signature style in the 20s. A prime example of this is Tarsila's painting, Abba Peru, one of her most celebrated works. The female bather. Tarsila took that on as a known and established European convention and translated it for her own purposes, for her own vision, but also related to the Brazilian that, landscape. That example of the bather helps me understand the cannibalism, taking something that's a trope in Western European art and turning into something extremely Brazilian. But after her most prolific period in the 1920s, Tarsila's world changed. She lost her wealth in the Great Depression, and not long after a military dictatorship took over Brazil, her work became more somber and political. She became a committed social painter while maintaining her absolutely refined and masterful style. She did not abandon what she had assimilated from modern art. She transformed that into a new kind of subject matter. Tarsila do Amaral died in 1973 at age 86. Decades later, she's remembered for sharing the beauty of Brazil through her paintings for an audience that continues to grow. Tarsila died almost 50 years ago. She's still very, very present. Very present, but essentially invisible to North American audiences. Until now. <laughs> Until now. <laughs> Any comments about her work? One last one. No comments? I liked her sort of natural pictures of Brazil. They're, they're, they're beautiful to me. And now she simplified everything. The moon by Tarsila. Yeah, they're not. I mean, amazing. look at that. That's that's beautiful. You're thinking of Spencer in the background, who we just saw with all these complex composition with numerous figures and uh, a lot going on, activities. And she's hers uh, have this stillness, a simplicity that uh, much more color, except for Spencer's landscapes. But but uh, oh. <laughs> But, but uh, and sir, I he was difficult to like except for his landscapes, right. but it was good to hear about his life. Okay, um, you didn't personally like the other paintings, the, the, the complex, no. okay. they made me scared. You made you scared, really? Yeah, yeah, okay. they, they were scary. Um, uh, and just so, just to, uh, well. <clears throat> To go back to the whole, for you, uh, Suan, um, trust your instincts, what you got reaction to a painting, and then uh -huh. don't stop there. So it's not like you did, but uh, the temptation is, oh, I'm scared. Uh, I'm like, <laughs> that's it. I don't want to have. I don't care about this painting painter anymore. Then you stop. So the whole point of our appreciation is to do that to acknowledge your own gut reactions, responses, but then. <clears throat> to not stop there. To yeah, at... yeah. Wow. So that's well, you a... know, when I was looking at his stuff, you know, I'm, I'm preparing myself for this class I'm teaching on T.S. Eliot and J. Alfred Prufrock. And those two were so influenced by the First World War. It was an awful, awful war to people. And I think they couldn't talk about it like people can today. So both of them and a lot of people at that time put their feelings into their art. Right. Yeah, that was part of his work. Yeah. Uh, but then I had, I mean, the, the incredible uh, 
destruction and violence and mass deaths of World War One. Right. Opened up a spiritual perspective, I think, or either nihilism or spirituality. People had to like go one way or the other. You know. Yes. A sense of what happened. Um, yes. Um, but I'm saying, okay, I don't know. Uh, he's his paintings are not just about World War One. Spence just jumping back to Spencer. I mean, he was. Um, there was I, I, you may have missed it. It didn't come through to you. The, there was a lot of joy and the. the I didn't see the joy. I saw. Yeah, okay. I saw the pain in there. I, I really saw the, his pain. This painting, The Moon, by Tarsila do um, Amor. The Moon. This painting, this painting, that's, The Moon. That's, uh, it's there in Spencer. Um, it's, more, it's more subdued, but the whole themes of resurrection. And, yes. And et cetera, et cetera. The, it's all there. <laughs> so it's not just about the pain of war, the people's suffering. So um, anyway. Uh, just, relate to her, she simplified, she's simplifying um, objects, simplifying, um, giving you a, um, whereas Spencer had multiple perspectives, say often in his, um, in his paintings, not the landscapes, but in his other visionary paintings, the multiple perspectives, um, a busyness, um, although it was be all unified by this common tone. Uh, she's, this woman has um, uh, simplified, and created a, a landscape from geometric shapes, a range and a very harmonious pattern. Mm -hmm. uh, uh. Moon by Tarsila do Amaral is one that came to the museum just about a year and a half ago. Oh, so big. it is a real newcomer to the collection of a 90 year old institution. And yet since it arrived, it's made more than its fair share of a mark. My name is Anne Temkin. I'm the Marie Jose and Henry Kravis Chief Curator of Painting and Sculpture here at the Museum of Modern Art. This is a painting that she debuted in Paris in 1928 when she was in her 40s and dividing her time between her native Sao Paulo and Paris where she had gone as a young woman to study art. And she believed that she would be, in her own words, the painter of her country, Brazil, but she also believed deeply in the modern experiments going on in Paris, and so felt it was her destiny to work there, as well as incorporating so much vocabulary that she brought with her from Brazil. And here in this landscape, moonscape really, you can see this idea of modernism, transatlantic modernism. You have a figure in the foreground that's very ambiguous. It looks pretty human, but it obviously also looks something like a plant or a cactus. Looking across what seems to be a river in a very abstract semicircle, and then another bit of green for more land, and then up to a blue sky with rippling clouds through it, kind of bordering or even enclosing this glowing three quarters moon. And you have the relationship between the figure and the moon in a way that actually I think has made a lot of our visitors think back to Van Gogh's Starry Night from about 30 years earlier. And I think also very much reminding people of the poetics of a contemporary of hers, Georgia O'Keeffe. This painting is placed beside a sculpture by Brancusi, a Romanian who came to Paris in the early 20th century and with whom she was friends. And it's a cross from Picasso's three musicians. Picasso was someone else who she knew well. So I think whereas maybe 20 or 40 years ago had this painting been at MoMA, we would have separated it into a gallery of South American art. Today, we're much more interested in all of the interconnections that in fact were happening then and realizing that art is an international language, not one that should be categorized in national boxes. It's an absolutely fantastic time to be a curator because we're involved in all of these inspiring rediscoveries. So this painting, I think, uh, for me, has a, um, just a feeling of mystery about it. 
the moon late night, uh, looking at the moon, kind of a sense of longing. I said the the waviness about it, the waves. Yeah. And the full circle, the person in that circle. So the waviness, yeah, it's a good point. The waviness has a femininity. This is like a feminine body shapes. Um, the moon is associated with the feminine, the mother. This is, you know. Yeah, so so there's all you're right, it's a good point. There's all this waviness, which has definitely um the the most the the lunar side of life which is or, or the nature organic side so it, it kind of taps you into what would be to me uh, uh what right brain intuitive uh, non-rational non-logical or verbal non-verbal side which night you know which the nighttime does um uh, the sun would be the the day, the light, the bright light would be the, the more masculine. Everything sharply defined, <clears throat> right angles, clear, objective, and this is just just that different, different side of life, of nature, of human beings. Is this a plant or a human? You know, is this a cactus or a person? I start, you know, a, there's an ambiguity um, at nighttime uh, about uh, objects. Is that a stick or a snake on the ground? You know, uh, uh, so yeah. So if you stand in front of it and just let that uh, part of you emerge, and, uh, and different, there's different levels. I think you know it goes starts. It's like this level. You're behind the person across the river, and then go across another field. And then you're into this uh, mysterious zone here, and then the moon, and then what's beyond the moon, and then you need to kind of keep going, uh, alternating with. Uh, she re recapitulates the light, the dark, and the light. Joe, you, you know, you said about the the longing of it, yeah. and uh, Mara actually told someone that green, the color green, increases longing. Oh really? Oh, I never heard. Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. In in Sufism, green is the color of God realization. The wow. Plane. So they so that's like I hadn't thought of that. So even the color has a spiritual, um, which she don't I don't think she did intentionally, but there's a spiritual um, quality to it, longing or or maybe um, <clears throat> spiritual enlightenment. Um, uh, yeah. So what did, did you say? The word was in Sufism. I said color green is associated with the seventh plane, color realization. Oh, really? Wow. Uh, well, and, and the Wizard of Oz, uh, Frank, uh, what's his name, the author? He knew, he knew about Sufism. Frank ba Baum? Baum, yeah. Baum, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the, um, the Emerald City. <laughs> All right. And, and that was their goal, you know. Uh, he did that intentionally. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, so uh, there's a simplicity in her paintings that's very different than Spencer say, and 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 so she's it's like he did his landscapes literally, okay they're beautiful, but uh, she's taken like his visionary ability that he put into paintings that had lots of people. She stripped the people. She has a few figures, but she's taken that uh, imaginary visionary quality, um, simplified it, and created these. Uh, landscapes in her work, or urban scapes with color, uh, geometric shapes, arrangement of geometric shapes. So, uh, yeah. And now, okay, so let's finish with one more. We have ten. We have one more. A more contemporary uh, Brazilian woman painter, who I think is kind uh, of, of course, everyone's. Oh, I think be influenced by uh, Tarsila in Brazil. So, uh, her name is Beatriz Milhazes. Uh, 
She was born in 1960, still alive. She's known for her work juxtaposing Brazilian cultural imagery and references to Western modernist paintings. Uh, she's very active in the LGBTQ community. Uh, she's been called Brazil's most successful contemporary painter. Okay. Uh, she's, her paintings are in the permanent collections of Museum of Modern Art, Guggenheim, Metropolitan Museum of Art, et cetera, et cetera. How old is she? She's born in 60, so 60, 40. 1960. 62. Abstract, colorful, also geometric, I think, I think you call it. Oh. Yeah. Uh, I am interested in conflict, and in the moment you add one more color, you start a conflict, which is endless. So it's a constantly movement to your eyes, to yourself, to your body. I, I like it. What I love is the city itself, the nature that we can find there the beauty that's a really beautiful city and a kind of a beauty that you never really get tired of it. And the contrast of colors, like you have the real strong blue with the green, all the time you have this green from the trees, from the gardens, from different places. I think the nature always participates on my work as an atmosphere. It's like it's surrounding me. I like to be surrounded by the nature. My studio is just beside the Botanic Garden. And so daily I have this kind of uh, exchange with the nature. This is something that really pleases me and, and makes me go back to the studio work. It's not that I really pick things that I go to each studio and use it, but that I really see and find interesting shapes. I think I need this area. It's Rio de Janeiro, but at the same time looks like a countryside out of Rio. But it's close to the nature, it's quiet. I always needed, I think, somehow this atmosphere for me to work. I always work with the idea of collages. But in the past, I cut out paper, cut out fabric, and even my the own canvas I made or paint something, and then afterwards I cut out and then glue it in a different place. So I did different ways dealing with the idea of collage, but I, I, I wanted to keep using this idea, but making my own motifs. So I discovered this technique that it is based on make a drawing on plastic paint it on a reverse and then I can glue it on the canvas and then after dry I can peel off the plastic and the image is there. So I just painted on one side. That's a fascinating technique. She paints on the plastic, glues it um, to the canvas and peels off the plastic and the painting. Right. This reverse and then I glue it. On, on canvas like this, and then I can, uh, when it's dry, I peel off the plastic, and then this image stay on canvas. So I can transfer whatever images I make. That opens a big door for my work, because it's a kind of a collage, but it's all acrylic paint. Like I only use paint, canvas, brushes, and, and that's it, but in a way that really dialogue with collage, with print, because all the images are made on reverse. And also I like paint, I like paint, so I like to, to, to use this material 
and, uh, and then uh, at the same time I like graphic results, I don't like brush strokes showing on the canvas, so I like this more soft surface. So texture of plastic that became very soft, all brush strokes is filtered by the, the texture of the plastic. So this has helped me with not only conceptually but about making my images really happen so the, the, the whole developing of the painting happened. I started in 2004 to have projects designed for buildings. When I saw the windows, I, uh, I had this idea about why not this maybe the place to plant something using the vinyl, translucent vinyl, and work with the stained glass idea, you know? Like a church, natural lights coming in, dialoguing. Because the idea was like, if it would, the, the windows would really handle all the space. Seria um, um, um triunvirato, que sempre foi, foram as minhas referências centrais, de alguma maneira continuam sendo, que é o Mondrian, é. Matisse e a Tarsila. Uh -huh. Aí, na também. sequência, uh -huh. você vê, então, uma Bridget Halle pela questão da OP, com a uh -huh. cor, e, uh -huh. e você tem também, a, como você falou, a Sônia Delané. Uh -huh. Quer dizer, a arte abstrata, em geral, eu, mas principalmente a construtiva e geométrica, são os meus pontos principais de observação. My, my work is very rational, no? It's very rational. It looks like uh, something about intensity, explosion, feeling, but it's not really. It's very rational. It's all very structured. Like if you talk about one of the paintings, like called Mulatim, the whole structure of the painting is based on a square grid. Even the circles that uh, make the kind of a sunset or sunrise, they have this square inside. Finishing the work is, is, is kind of uh, always difficult to find this moment, you know, that you really say, oh, okay, darn. I finish the work. For me, is when the color, the structure and colors are all really balanced in a way I, um, I wanted since the beginning somehow. I would, after 25 years or a little more years working uh, with painting, I would I would love to say no, now it's so easy, but like, it's, it's getting worse and worse actually. I think the, the white canvas is still a challenge and, and I, I would say a bigger challenge now because after doing so many things, how to move and pushing forward, I feel it's endless. You never really arrive anywhere, you arrive in different places, but never in a place that okay, now it's fine. Um, I will sit here, so and it's comfortable. No, it's always uncomfortable somehow. Someone's got their mic on. They're going to get a lot of noise. Last one. Sorry about that. Okay, this is Wiki Art with her. Uh, I just look at some of her <coughs> work on Wiki Art for the last five minutes. I'm going to start with number one. Come back. Okay. <clears throat> I like mandalas in a way. I call it the kiss. Yeah. 
you really appreciate the color, but you don't get the message from this work. Um, it's a beautiful color, but but I look at it and I appreciate the color, but I don't get any anything that uh, about the painting really. Well, like any abstract painting, the the, the message, if you think of message is. Um, um, <clears throat> referring to something necessarily in the outside world what's what's your emotional response to this very very pleasing you get a pleasing right. a pleasing response to the colors and the and the yeah. different designs right but but you don't get a message of what's going on you know well what would be an example yeah. of a message like what well like the like the previous uh, the first artist spencer Right. You got a message of, of, of an emotional message of of uh, World War II or or the Riveters or you know you you could you could sense you could sense something that you could identify with some physical action or emotion. Here it's more sensual. Yeah. So, well, the, so the, the title the title is Mariposa. It means right. butterfly. Right. That's right. And it's very pleasing. So the idea of abstract art then has uh, the the message is in the it's in the color, it's in the arrangement. Uh, it's it's inside the canvas. Yes, and, yes. Uh, if you appreciate the beautiful colors. Yeah. Or the or the way the colors are arranged. Yes, but, or the arrangement. Yeah. Sure. But also they have a, there's an emotion that in itself, I uh, if you allow it will evoke an emotional response, um, and uh, if you stay with it, based on just what's on the canvas without any reference to the outside world, events in the outside world. So there's, yeah, so there's the bleak, but there's also interwoven in here are, are the black uh, uh, that weaves, this black uh, color that weaves through. And so there's, that might to me mean there's a, a bright, cheerful uh, aspect to life. Uh, butterflies have a short life; they die. I mean, I always think of death with uh, with black. So there's um, there's that comes up for me. Um, <clears throat> it's kind of also bright and brief, and actually, it looks like an antenna, almost like a head antenna. That black part. Okay. All right. Keep moving. So I think. Uh, So the, the appreciation of any abstract art is to just simply um, notice the, the arrangement of colors, the flow, the design, uh, the well, juxtaposition of colors on, the first, on first glance, to stay with that. Secondly, um, well, it doesn't have to be in this order, but at some point, what's my emotional response to evoke any uh, some feelings of joy or despair or, or, or several different feelings. Um, any, any, and then also any um, memories or images come to mind as I, as I look at this, any associations, okay. That, so it's, it's meant to be, any, any good abstract word, it's meant to be evocative uh, in its own right. Uh, <clears throat> So your first impression may be, uh, oh, this is pleasing, uh, but maybe if you stay if you stay with it more, that something else will come up. Maybe uh, there'll be some other response. Eagle. Uh. Yeah, this to me has a uh, well, like a night quality to it, evening, late evening, night tonal quality. I, I see nature. I see uh, organic forms that somehow some of them come into a, a familiar 
image of a circular flower flowering in any case. Uh, the way nature just kind of ex explodes upward, but it's it's evening for me, and there's still shades of daylight hanging around. So there's kind of a nostalgia to me about this too. I like the way she introduces the black. It's not threatening. Right. There's this orange tone, which is like almost less rays of sunlight. There's a sunsetting evening. Uh, the night's the night's coming on, but the day is still uh, still there. Beleza. Chukito. Chukito. Well, you need a translator. I don't know these words, but uh -huh. I'm very curious. <laughs> well. Kind of like a atomic structure or something. Mega Maluka. Wow. Sort of a feeling of um, stars, explosion of stars. I loved hearing her what she was saying, you know, just kind of a beautiful within her. Yeah, I know. Latino. So this has warm colors, the reds, the oranges, pinks, a little bit of black. This has a daylight. Well, I mean, that, 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 what, that white with the black, it could be an atomic thing or it could be. Oh, a yeah. flower. Yeah, I know. Wow. Yeah. Like that one. Patience uses words. This is 24 32. Yeah, three. Popeye, wow. I wish they put a translation of the titles instead of giving their name every time. Carambola. Mm. Well, to me, these have a I used the word mandala, mandalas. Yeah. And, and um, she's, it's like a, a, a jazz riffs on the concept of mandalas because she's using repeating circles and, and uh, repeating patterns. But this is done in a, um, in a way that's, it's like a, a variations on the theme of mandalas. So mandalas are meant to focus. The circle, what are, what's the purpose of the mandala? To kind of draw you inward through this, through this um, circle, to this, uh, the idea of the circle and repeating patterns that um, have a, a meditative inward quality. And so I think for me, um, these do, in that sense, you could just use it as a, something as a, a focal point for meditation. I could say, I could think of maybe this, for instance, like I might want to say this, might rep or even any of these circles, this one, this one, 
might represent the self, capital S, you know, or this. Or this could represent the inner worlds, you know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, this got a little bit, see, uh, some of you have seen the diagrams in God Speaks of the subtle world now, or there's some similarity actually. Um, worlds within worlds, <laughs> dimensions, subtle energy dimensions. I get that, you know, the flow, just these flows of energy. So that to me, there's a, uh, it, it's an, there's an inner, otherworldly, transpersonal dimension to these. Right? So that's so, it, and yeah, they don't refer to anything in the in our physical world. <clears throat> but, but they're very stimulating, I would say. Another world, perhaps that she's pointing to or or evoking. Uh, so let's say there's another inner world that she's evoking through these image through these uh, uh, patterns. That's what I get. The more I look at. So, uh, so I see them as as uh, like like I could meditate on them and just uh, kind of <clears throat> brings a sense of stillness and also energy flow of energy. Well, I like this. Love this one. Wow. That's why. Mm. All right. Sakados. So I'm getting how the name is. Malib and Motor, Beatrice Mohazi. So that's it for today. What time is it for? So, very different painters, huh? Spencer and the two Brazilian women. Thank you. Yeah. Ah. Fabulous. I think uh, Mr. Spencer Excellent. is one of the best painters we've seen. Yeah. So, we loved him. Back over him. Uh, revisit those wiki art stanley spencer <laughs> yeah, he was great okay great so two weeks don't know what i'm gonna do but it'll be a surprise <laughs> <laughs> is, is that halloween oh uh, wait a minute good point uh yeah it is but uh that doesn't matter to me i'm gonna can... that's okay with us yeah <laughs> me too <laughs> you, can wear, you can wear a costume if you want <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, thank you much, Joe. Okay, my pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.